I was a prison guard for 23 years at the United States Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois, and this is a part of my story. I was asked, who's the toughest, strongest prisoner that you ever met in all those 23 years? There's uh, really no one answer to that. Uh, I've met many tough, strong prisoners uh, and in different ways too. There's mentally strong and there's physically strong. I can tell you what I think he meant. He met a guy named Green. Green. Jamil, I'm the executive producer of Gully TV. We spoke prior. Um, I'm a fan of your show. I'd like to uh, welcome you um, to my platform. Um, the, the video that, uh, I'll give you some history on, um, the video that actually attracted, attracted me to your platform. You did a video on Tom Silverstein, Terrible Tom, and, um, you spoke about his history, you know, with, you know, with the D.C. Blacks and all of that. I actually, um, I've interviewed guys from the Washington, D.C. car, you know, who served time in the federal system, and, um, because of that, I, you know, I became a fan of your platform. I started to listen to other videos, and yeah, I, I think it's very, very interesting, a, a very interesting career that you have for yourself. Could you um, tell my viewers your name, where you're from, and how you got into corrections? because it just paid more than being a, a regular street cop. And uh, out in Washington State, I was only getting 10 bucks an hour, and they offered me like 14 and um, uh, a bunch of benefits that I wasn't getting before. So it, it just seemed like a logical thing to do. Plus, when I moved to Southern Illinois, the, the cost of living was actually much lower than out in Washington State. So I, I benefited many different ways by uh, over. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, of course you could have you could have served as a correctional officer in the state. You ended up in a federal system. How did you um, end up in such such dangerous institutions? Was it a progression? Did you start off at, at mediums or different institutions, or you went straight to the the maxes? I, I went straight to the super max, and that's just kind of the way I always did when I joined the military. I asked the, the recruiter, you know, what's the what's the worst place for MP? What's the place nobody wants to go? And he said, Fort Hood. And I said, okay, sign me up for that. And so that's just kind of the way I've been forever. Wow. Um, can you recall, can you recollect um, your first day at, at the ADX? Your first day at work. I'm pretty sure you probably remember it. Yeah, it was, uh, the, the funny thing is we had a, a another guy that was a, a police officer and we've been talking and uh, when we went in you hear that big door slam behind you know the, the I guess the reason they call prison the slammer you hear the door slam and uh, this cop this, this recently ex-cop said screw this he turned around and he said open the door and let me out he, he wanted gone and uh, the place was really claustrophobic back then because you know I wasn't used to it I mean you're in a little place trapped with, with people and probably feels the same for the inmates. Uh, you know, I mean, I can't leave. Um, kind of a, a scary feeling. And then the first thing that, that struck me was how clean the place is. I mean, it is like super clean. You can lick the floor. Um, it's just that clean because people have nothing else to do than clean. Not only that, it's a respect thing. Um, prisons, especially the dangerous ones, there, there's such a high level of respect because the penalty is going to be blood. Um, there's going to be a whole lot of please, thank you, everybody's going to be cordial, the place is going to be clean, the inmates' hygiene, everything's going to be correct. And uh, if it, at, at any time when an inmate violated, violates that prison code, the convict code, there's going to be some penalties. So, um, yeah, I'm not surprised that it was very, very clean, despite them having a whole lot of time on their hands. That's just the law of the institutions. Yeah, you're right, because, like, the lower-level prisons aren't like that. They're, they're a lot more dirty. 
<laughs> oh wow. Um, are there any particular reputable inmates that you would like to um, share names that my listeners would be familiar with? Yeah, they probably heard of Jeff Ford, um, leader of the Yellow Rookins that came out of Chicago. He, uh, he's like a, how would I describe it? He's like the general of a, of a military formation. I mean, the, the people that call him and talk to him from the outside, it's sir, yes, sir. And they have their own language, a, a code. And, uh, you know, they, they're saying a lot of things that, like, people like me wouldn't understand because I'm just not in the group. But uh, they're extremely disciplined. His family, when they come, they're, uh, he, he uses his children or grandchildren to, to run interference for him so that he can communicate whatever it is that he's wanting to get across. And uh, it's, it's very well organized and very disciplined. And uh, I've, I've heard that in the community he was the, the, the same way. You know, he, uh, he played politics very well. I mean, he was invited to go to... Uh, Richard Nixon's inauguration. Correct. I've got to say something for him. Yeah, he was big business in Chicago. He's still a big deal, very, very big deal. He's a, uh, I think he's the chief of the the L. Rookins, the peace, probably the Peace Stone Nation. That's what they're known as now, the Peace Stones, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, Jeff Ford. Um, that's definitely somebody that everybody who follows my platform would be very, very, very familiar with. He received all of that time because they were trying to buy a rocket launcher. Um, yeah, apparently he was involved with um, you know Gaddafi and Libya and that sort of thing. Right. That's, that's not why he ended up in the federal system. And like he, uh, he's a, I don't know what you want to call it, a calming factor in a cell house you know if there's a problem and Ford sees that he's, he's causing issues like with me you cause an issue with me and I cause an issue with everybody so Fort would go and have a little chat with somebody and say look stop pissing that guy off or you're gonna have an accident and that was the end of the problem right yeah he's shot caller on the highest level definitely definitely yeah people weren't assassinated I don't think I'm not involved with it, but I don't think people are assassinated without his signature. You know, he's got to sign off on it. Wow. Um, do you, um, are you familiar with the D.C. Blacks? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was as familiar as I am with my own hand. Yeah. <laughs> what can you remember about the D.C. Blacks? I've had the pleasure of interviewing a couple of guys who are, you know, somewhat affiliated with the D.C. Blacks, but... What what uh what do you remember about the DC inmates period? And then we'll go to the DC blacks and the thing with Cadillac and Silverstein, etc. But what do you recall about Washington DC? Um, they're a pain in the ass. I mean, um, the non-cooperative as a group. I'm saying um, there's individuals that are slightly less pain in the ass, and then there's some that are like a lot more pain in the ass. Um, but as a group, it, 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 like when they shut down the, the, the D.C. system and, and all them guys came into the federal system, we just groaned. and like, oh, God, not this. And it turned out to be just, just exactly that. I mean, we had, we had disturbances all, uh, all the time uh, right after they came into the system because I think they had to um, show their dominance and their power. And they're not an actual organization. But they hang together because, hey, I know you, you know me, you know, we were out on whatever street. Um, I lived in the D.C. area for a while, and there was a couple of guys that I know I met them, but we had no, we had no memory of each other. It was like, I remember an incident that they were at, and they were like, wow, you were there? You know, that kind of thing. Right. And, uh, um, we had a guy named Hassan. And Hassan had a hand that if he shook my hand, my hand would like just disappear into it. Like all I'd see is the end of my arm. He was that big. And uh, Hassan punched the guy in the face once, once, and broke his uh, eye orbit and his jaw in one punch. This guy was just gigantic. And uh, um, he never went anywhere voluntarily. Uh, it, it just 
was his code, and he was a DC black. Like, if I came and said, look, you have to go from 10 cell, I'm going to move you to 11 cell. Make me. And it's like, God damn, now we got to call in a team and beat the shit out of this guy and drag him over there. But that's, <laughs> that. he, he was just like, oh, that's the way it is. That's how he gave it up. Yeah, some guys are hardcore like that. Hassan from the D.C. block. What institution was this? This is Marion. It's all of this is at USP Marion. Okay. Um, was what were, were they a big part of the uh, the MA population at Marion? Was D was DC pretty uh, dominant as far as numbers? No, but they were a significant group, but they weren't a dominant. But they were a, like. Between them and the Aryan Brotherhood, they caused the most trouble. And they caused the most trouble between each other. The Aryan Brotherhood and the D.C. Blacks were just at war. So, uh, I mean, that went on for decades. Whenever anybody could get at anybody, there was a problem. So that was a, the, that was just a regular part of your career as a corrections officer, D.C. and Aryan Brotherhood beefing with each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, the, that was probably the... That's where we would get injured, you know, getting in between the two. You said that's where y'all would get injured? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it, it, it was like we're in the way. So if they got to, like, injure one of us to get one of them, and I'm talking about either group, then that's just kind of the way it was. Right. Um, <clears throat> prior to um, you being employed as a corrections officer, were you familiar with who Thomas Silverstein was? And the, um, Never heard of them. And those two, those two murders happened at the institution that you worked at. Yes, yeah, all that happened there. Can you give me some, give my listeners some history on what happened? What, was it 1982? That was, was that the last time that they were not locked down? Yeah, that's when, uh, that's when the Silverstein murder happened, uh, and uh, oh, I have to get the name of the other guy. Um, uh, well, anyway, there was there was two murders of uh, correctional officers, and that was a, a beef with the uh, Aryan Brotherhood, and um, that's when they locked down. And I came on board in 1989, and uh, those murders were in '85. They started locking down more or less in '82, um, when uh, the ABs and the and the BC uh, Blacks started having at it. But then there was that murder in '85. So the double murder in 85 was the two correctional officers, and that's when they locked it down completely. And everybody was locked down in their cell except for 30 minutes a day. And that's when, that's when I came on board. So af- after, after, the, after the two murders, it became a supermax. It, it was never to, they were never locked. Um, they were never a general population institution anymore. It was every total lockdown after that. Yes, and no inmate was allowed to be in the presence of any other human without being, like, fettered, like cuffs, leg irons, all that stuff. All right, now with, with, with those types of precautions added, how does there still exist a war between the D.C. blacks, and, and how do they continue to get at, get at each other? They're, it's a non-contact institution, and, and they're not supposed to have contact with each other. Well, what would happen is a lot of times we would let out inmates on the range. So you've got inmates out on the range and you got inmates in their cell, and they can see one another. And occasionally one would take a mop handle and sharpen the end and try to spear the guy laying on his bed. Uh, they, would, they would throw things on each other. Uh, sometimes they'd try to light fires and set each other on fire. Um, we had one incident I remember where... Uh, Way back then, they encouraged inmates to smoke, and they gave them matches. And nobody on on, on the uh, the lower rungs of the prison, like like I was, had had any doubt that this was not a good idea. So they took these matches, they mixed it with um, um, the carbon paper that we gave them from the typewriters and creamer that came for their coffee. These little packages. When you mix that in certain proportions, it makes a very um, effective explosive. So they would try to shoot one another or blow each other up. So, like, we had one instance that, that I remember. I was in the cell house next to the cell house when this incident happened. I heard what I said was a shotgun. We heard a big explosion, and I said, hell, that's a shotgun. 
And so I go running over to the unit, and there's a guy laying on the on the on the range holding his face, and blood is just pouring between his fingers. And uh, what had happened was, um, the guy in the cell hated the guy that was out on the range, and he said, "Hey, come over here for a second. Look at this. What is this?" And the guy had put uh, basically a bomb on his bars, and it was directional. Had a bunch of screws and, and stones and whatever this guy could find from projectiles. <laughs> he just he just set it off in this guy's face and it blew out one of his eyeballs and messed up his face and, and uh, like hit him in the throat. It was uh, it was like wow, they're shooting at each other, you know. So, so this is ways to get at each other. This is your this is what you look forward to at work every day. Yeah, I was in a fight every week for my career. I mean, it, and we had some times where it went three weeks and we were in some kind of physical altercation and people were like, What's up? What's happening? You know, it's it's like the dam is getting ready to bust or they're gonna have a riot, you know, people got suspicious. Or oh, if it wasn't no wreck, if it wasn't no fights and shit, y'all y'all thought something the big one was coming. Yes, that's exactly what it was. It was like, hey, they must be saving up for something. <laughs> wow. Out of the two, out of the two groups, who who was the most problematic between the, the Aryans and the DC Blacks? The DC Blacks were more annoying, but the Aryan Brotherhood were more dangerous. I mean, they uh, well, um. They wrapped a guy in a sheet. This guy, we called him the, uh, um, oh man, we called him the Zulu Warrior. And the Zulu Warrior was a little black guy. He was from D.C. And he wore t-shirts that said, kill me. And he went up and down the range taunting the, the Aryan Brotherhood members, you know, like, you're all punks and stuff. And we're like, oh, this guy, and he did it to us, too. He would throw things at us. He was just an annoying guy. And so one day, two of the um, Aaron Brotherhood members wrapped him in a sheet and stabbed him, I don't know, 60 times or something, an a, a, a inordinate amount of times. And he died. And um, it was in a unit that Jeff Fort was in, and we suspected that he signed off on this guy's murder because he was pissing us off. And the next day, all the staff was happy, and they, all the... The inmates were happy, and it just freaked the warden out. He's like, "Why the hell are you people happy? It's because the Zulu warriors dead. We're sick of his ass." Um, you know, so the Aryan Brotherhood. Excuse me, sir. Sir, before you go any further, I gotta um, clarify that it, it, <clears throat> that it's total speculation that Jeff Ford was associated with that. I have to yeah, say that total speculation. Okay. I just think that because. He was such a powerful person, and he was in that unit. But I don't know that he signed off on anything. Okay. Um, yeah, because um, I'm this this your the way your media platform is and mine. I'm held accountable for the shit that's said over here. So we got to we got to be 100 percent correct when mentioning somebody of his caliber and his magnitude. But um, yeah, not to cut you off. Uh, at gen so generally, that's what your career consisted of. You uh retired at that institution? Yes. Yeah, I'm retired now. Okay. I retired in um, December of 2012. How many years did you put in before retirement? 23. 23 years. Um, is that the institution that John Gotti served time at? Yeah, he used to be in my cell house. Oh, you had Gotti in your cell house? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was... Uh, and he was a big name then, too. I mean, he used to get, like... like most of the time, a cell house would get one bag of mail. Gotti got one bag of mail for him. <laughs> wow. And I, I used to work with a lady, and she said, hey, do you ever read any of Gotti's mail? I said, nah. And she said, oh, man, you got to read some of his mail, because we're allowed to. Uh, we're actually, it, they want us to. And uh, so I started reading his incoming mail. And, man, he got some strange mail. People that were applying to be a member of the, of the mafia. <laughs> women that would send pictures of themselves naked. You know, all kinds of just very bizarre people. And, and regular guys, too. I mean, did he, did, to, go ahead. Did he maintain the same flamboyant character 
um, in the institution as he did, you know, as as the, the federal agents depicted him when they was investigating him? Did he still have that same flair as a inmate? Well, since I didn't know him before, I can tell you that he had a presence. I mean, when I was there the day that he arrived, and I was in the unit that he was first put in. He was in the uh, segregation when they when he first arrived. They put you in segregation. They they figure out where they want to put you, and that might take a week or so. And so I was in that unit. So when he arrived, all the inmates. Didn't matter if they were a DC black from New York, a white guy, a, a made man. It didn't matter who you were. All of them said things like, um, "You know, is there anything I can do for you, Mr. Gotti? Uh, uh, you, you, you need some some candy? Um, you know, is there something I can I can get you?" I mean, everybody uh, from the inmate side was was like that. So, yeah, he. Uh, and wherever he went, he was he stood out. And one time, uh, I wasn't there. I just heard about it from my friends. One time, him and a guy um, bumped, like you know, like a, there was a upper range, and it's only eighteen inches wide. So for me to get past you, you have to turn sideways, and I have to turn sideways, and then we go past each other. But right. honey, and this this guy, they're. They're both too big to do that. You know, I'm a big, tough guy, and I don't get out of anybody's way. And they both felt that way. So they bumped. They exchanged a bunch of words. And then the next day, I had to go down there while this guy was thumping the shit out of Gotti. <laughs> we had to put him into protective custody because we were afraid that he would be murdered. And uh, later... Can, can you remember his name? I, I think I remember his name. I heard of him. Uh, I don't remember it right off the top of my head. I believe he was from I believe he was from Washington D.C. Yeah, he was a D.C. guy. Yeah, right. And he got in trouble again in D.C. He ended up in a D.C. jail, and uh, somebody ended up stabbing the hell out of him there. And it was always uh, the rumor had it that uh, Gotti was responsible for that. Oh. Okay. And it's the same thing as like with Jeff Ford. It's like, yeah, I strongly suspect that that's true, but I can't prove it. Right. Right. Oh boy. So, damn, you seen you you came to work and seen Gotti actually getting his ass kicked. That's crazy. Yeah, I was. I ran down there when the when the, he had him down. Was stomping him good. It was like, wow, that's uh, he's taking some blows there. And then I saw him getting beat, and I was there when they when they asked him about it, and he said he fell down the stairs. <laughs> oh yeah, no 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 snitching, no snitching. No. He's, they, uh, and that's the way everybody was. No one would snitch on anybody, really. I mean, when you got into the upper level, they didn't snitch. It didn't matter what happened. Right. You know, I've seen guys getting stabbed to death in the shower, and his dying declaration is, I slipped and fell on a towel. You know, things like that. Oh, my goodness. Wow. The, um, the, the, the weapon, the weaponry. What was uh what was it like coming to work knowing that they were armed, and and, and things of that nature? Um, were you ever put in a situation where you had to interfere with somebody being um I don't know stabbed or something like that? Um, yeah, often, very often. You said very often. <laughs> yeah, they could, they could elaborate. God damn. Um. Right. And um, what what killers want to do is they want to eliminate their target because if you don't, he's going to come back and get you. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that he's dead. So you will ignore people like me. I'll roll up on you and say, stop. And you just keep stabbing. So I end up having to crack you in the head or, or uh, you know, hit you with a stick to put you out of commission to make you stop stabbing somebody. And that matter what happened. Uh, quite often. So uh, that that stick has that stick has basically probably saved a lot of people's lives. Oh, there's no doubt, no doubt. Um, yeah, I used it quite often, and I had officers that just would never carry their stick, and I was like, "What are you stupid or what?" I mean, this thing might save your neck. And we had a guy from uh, he 
was from Seattle. I never remember people's names hardly. I'm, I'm terrible with that. This guy was called the Green Dragon, apparently, in the Seattle area. They had a gang called the Green Dragon. And he was kind of like a little Bruce Lee. And uh, um, he was stabbing some guy. I told him to stop, which he did, which surprised me. And then he turned his attention to me. And I said, oh, yeah, this isn't good. So um, he dropped into one of them, you know, Taekwondo stances or, or whatever. I knew I was in a real problem. And uh, uh, I was the one in the lead. There was people behind me, but I'm the one in the lead. So I ended up hitting him in the forehead with this, the end of this stick. As I rolled up in his head, he fall, fell over and, and blood spurted out of his head. And my friend behind me said, oh, you killed him. And I thought, crap, he's dead. Shit. And then uh, he moaned a little bit and moved. And then I had to play it off like, you know, oh, yeah, he ain't dead. He'll be okay. <laughs> Since we that was probably the worst one I ever had when he turned his attention to me and had a shake in his hand. I thought, oh, here we go. So it's safe to say that all races in in this institution, all races, it wasn't just blacks and whites that was getting it in or uh, that was creating problems. You said this guy was probably Asian or something like that. So Yeah, he was, he was um, Vietnamese, if I'm not mistaken. So basically anybody who was at this institution was violent. That's why they were there, yeah. There, was, there, there wasn't any of uh, the, the peacenik guys, you know what I mean? They, they just weren't there. Like, even the, or they were, they were escape problems, like, uh, um, you probably know Woody Harrelson, the, the television and movie actor. He had a, he had a father named Charles Harrelson who assassinated a federal judge, and federal judges get really upset when you shoot one of their own. And, uh, so he ended up getting, like, double or triple life it was it was forever and he tried to escape from uh, a federal prison i think it was atlanta like they they caught him with the, the ladders the rope i mean it was it was just obvious he was he was on his way over the, the wall and god and so they sent him to marion and uh um he was he was like an, a paid assassin for the mafia, you know, and, and he didn't really stick out other than his kid was famous. You know, I mean, that was the kind of people that we had. Right. But it was very well known that 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 was Woody's father. Like everybody knew it. Yeah, but he was known more for shooting a federal judge. <laughs> All the prisoners love that, you know. Yeah, shoot another one, you know, like that thing. Right. Because. Most of them have been given long sentences by a federal judge, and they hated them, all of them. So, let me ask you this: um, I've served time. I, I was never in a federal institution. I did my time in state. Um, <clears throat> some of the most brilliant people I've encountered was in in, in these institutions. I want to know about some of the geniuses you met. Some of the guys, the MacGyvers. Some of the guys that can make something out of nothing. You know what I'm saying? I'm pretty sure you had. You remember? Uh, they, you just described them creating a bomb out of creamer and carbon paper. You know what I'm saying? Uh, was there any standout inmate that was known as a genius, like could do anything? Yeah, we had a guy. Um, oh, man. Let me think about his name. Anyway, he, uh, he was uh, a hijacker. And hijacked an aircraft, he escaped. I mean, he, he did a good job. The only thing that, that tripped him up was the FBI found a fingerprint on something that he left behind, and they tracked him down and caught him. Otherwise, he would have got away with it. Broke a couple of his legs when he jumped out of the plane. Um, he jumped out of a plane? <laughs> yeah, he jumped out of an aircraft. He did the same thing like D.G. Cooper did. He, he, he did. As a matter of fact, he told me that he learned the mistakes that he thinks D.B. Cooper made and then he corrected them. He just made his own mistakes. <laughs> he survived um, jumping from an aircraft? Yeah, 747 over, you know, over the U.S. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, he, he was this, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, like, um, he was a genius in his own way. He's the smartest inmate that I think I've ever met. And he was able to manipulate situations to get what he wanted. Like, he's, him and it, it took a group of 40 inmates to get me kicked out of his unit once. This guy did it on his own. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was they, grievance slips? No, what they do is they complain all the time. And they 
said, you know, everything will be nice in here, uh, Warden, if you get this guy out. <laughs> you guy know, used to hearing that. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Right. So, they were able to file enough complaints and get enough people that, that believed his story that, that he was able to get me removed from the unit. So it was like, wow, man, he is making the personnel decisions for the Bureau. <laughs> you said this guy, this one guy did what it took 40 inmates to do, basically. Yeah, I had a whole cell house get pissed off at me one time, and they all complained, and so they decided to remove me, and they always told me, well, it's for your safety because they're going to kill you. And it's like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's for my safety, my ass. It's because they're causing a lot of complaints, and you don't like it. The, um... The racial complexion of um, correctional institutions, normally they're situated in rural areas, so the the population of the staff is generally Caucasian. Um, was there any problems with race relations while you were there? Now, you got a situation where you have an openly pro-white, dangerous um, prison gang, the Aryan Brotherhood, There's they, they're present, and then you have correctional officers from the middle of nowhere who've never never interacted with a black person responsible f with confining them what ha what happens with the race relations between you guys the the, 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 the um the captors and the inmates uh i would say that there are exceptions to this rule but i would say that 98 percent of the time that wasn't a factor the way we looked at it, and the way they looked at it was, uh, you know, there's this, there's this line, and it doesn't matter what race, color, creed, religion you are on that other side of the line, you're on the other side of the line. So um, the inmates would try to manipulate us by, they would try to separate it, you know, like um, when we first started getting women, we had a black female, and then they just tore into her constantly about, oh, you're a, you love them white guys, and she was married to a white guy, which was funny. Oh, she was a, you know she was a, a, a black female correction off, corrections officer. Yeah, she was bottom of the barrel, same as me, just a correctional officer, and then they would try to manipulate her into, you know, like, we are the only ones that are going to look out for you. And uh, them white guys that you work with will, you know, leave you in a lurch and on and on and on. And they didn't, they didn't realize it, that she was married to a white guy. <laughs> of course she was. She's a, she's a correctional officer in the middle of nowhere. She, that ain't, you ain't gonna get nobody from no urban area, that, area that's gonna even accept that type of job, I don't think. No, they, uh, they would recruit as much as they could. Okay. And they, they would beg people, and, and and if you were a Hispanic male, for example, um, they would they would try to do everything they could to get you to come work at Marion. Like they would they would help you with housing, um, whatever problem you had, they would try to solve it so that you would come and work there. And it, it was very difficult. We had very few non-white. Uh, staff members, because like you said, we're in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Um. If, if I lived in New York City and I came here, it would be a huge culture shock. Definitely. Definitely. Can you recall who was the most powerful black man at Marion d during your career there? Hands down, Jeff Ford. No, no doubt. <laughs> He said, hands down, Jeff Ford, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it just was. I mean, everybody knew that, you know. Who was, the, were, who was the most powerful white man there during the course of your um, stay? Oh, uh, boy, that probably. Well, it, when I first arrived there, it might have been a guy named Garrett Trapnell. He was a hijacker, and he was so dangerous, they made a new unit for him, K-Unit, which was the, the predecessor of the communications and management unit, which you hear about all the time, is this secret prison, and and they have it Marion now. Um, this Garrett Trapnell was such a problem, such a pain, so manipulative, that they basically made a unit to put him in, 
when you say these things, right, how does somebody get these labels? Uh, when you say manipulative, manipulative or dangerous, has he did he attack staff or was he a dangerous danger to other inmates? Because the prison is full of dangerous motherfuckers. I mean, what made him so such a problem that it was required that they created a, a unit for him? Because he was able to, to um, gaslight people to the point where they would do incredibly insane things. Like the Strapnell talked a woman into believing that she was in love with him and all she had to do was break him out of prison to uh, um, live the good life. So she went to the local airport, stuck a gun in a pilot's face of a helicopter, flew it to the prison, landed outside the yard. Um, she picked the wrong guy. He was an ex-Vietnam vet. He has a fist fight with this woman over the gun in the uh, helicopter, and the pilot ends up shooting her dead. <laughs> oh, God damn. damn. This sounds like a goddamn sci-fi movie. This is all a true story. What's this guy's name? Gary who? Uh, Garrett Trapnell. So how was it? Uh, how was he tied to the situation of all of that transpired outside of the institution? He, he did all of this by communicating by letter and phone to this woman. That's how he convinced her. He was just that good. I mean, he was like a psychological genius. I mean, he could he could talk people into anything. He even talked the woman who was killed by the pilot into believing that he was her father, which he wasn't, and she hijacked a plane, uh, a passenger liner, and tried to get the FBI to release Trapnell so she wouldn't blow up the plane. Uh, she couldn't blow up the plane because the bomb was fake, but nobody knew that. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. And he talked her into that. So imagine that your your mother was died for this guy, and now you're willing to do it because you think... That's your dad, even though it's not. Like, oh my God. So that's why he was so dangerous. They put him in a place where he couldn't communicate with anybody. Because if he did, who knows what the result would have been. Were you ever injured at work? Were you ever assaulted at work? Anybody ever swing and punch you or grab you? Or... Yeah. That happened all the time. You know, I, I, I got um, bumps and bruises and that kind of thing. But like, I never I'm, I'm not before. talking about when y'all assaulting somebody, you know, like when y'all breaking up a fight and y'all start roughing guys up, you know, and there's, you get injured during the, during the course of that. I'm talking about while you were working in a house, like you said, you had a, a unit. Did somebody attack you? Yes, but um, because I kept my stick with me all the time and would use it freely, um... You know, I only got, like, kicked or, you know, thrown into something. Like, I never got threw off a tier or anything like that, which is what they like to do, throw me off a tier. Um, that never happened because, I don't know, I was just fortunate. There, were, How many tiers were there at, at Marion? Not many. It was only two. So it was the bottom floor where the, the you know, the big floor is, and then there was that one <coughs> tier at the top that had an 18-inch white catwalk, and that was it. Right. Some prisons got like, you know, three and four of them things. It's all a long way, but we didn't. What would keep you going back to such a dangerous job? Were you were you were you comfortably compensated? Well, I retired uh in twenty twelve. I was making about fifty grand a year. I, I have friends that make a hundred grand a year because they like to work a lot of overtime. Um I get a, a fabulous retirement. I mean, I'm retired now and I don't I don't do anything I don't want to do. And that was the big draw for me was you can retire at 50 and walk off into the sunset. And so for me, that was the big benefit. Wow. What was... Uh... And I guess <coughs> one of the things that would keep me going back is, you know, I kind of... I was always drawn to that type of thing, you know, I mean, I went to the military and then I worked at the worst place that the, the military police could work, you know, I, I was a small town cop in a, in a place where there was five cops and like 3,000 people and nothing ever happened and they offered me to go to like the supermax prison where guards got murdered, hey, get out of the way, I'm going, you know, and I got paid better and I lived in a cheaper place. Right. Um, wow. 
while you were working there, did you stay in with that's Illinois, right? Yeah. Okay. So you stayed in Illinois back about twenty years? Oh, maybe thirty. More than that, yeah. Was there and then I still maintain a house here. Um but I've been living mostly overseas. You just happen to catch me when I'm I'm here at the moment. The um the murder of the uh correctional officer in the eighties by um Thomas Silverstein, he ended up being essentially buried in, in correctional in, in a basement in what I read an article that he wrote called Buried Alive. I can't remember what institution he was in, but he died recently, like a year or so ago. Yeah, I think it was Atlanta, I don't think that's where he was at. And yeah, they had a like no contact at all with that guy. He was like in his own little cell, talked to him on a telephone, and I've never seen it. I never been there. It was just what people that were there told me about that they didn't allow him um to even have contact with humans. They were they were afraid that he would murder more. Because he told people that. He he told people, I'm going to kill more of you. So of course they didn't right. they didn't trust him. Right. He, he proved it in the past. Was there a a particular uh, incident that stands out to you as the most violent um, during the course of your career as a corrections officer? Something that was traumatic to you? I mean, you said they was getting at each other every day, but is there an incident that it was just over the top? Yeah, we had, uh, oh, what was it? The dog unit fight. There was a there was an incident in dog unit. There was a guy named Green, and this Green was one of them monstrous people. And uh, Green and all, and he was a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. And him and all of his Aryan Brotherhood buddies got drunk. Not to cut and you he, off. When you say monstrous, uh, when you say monstrous, and you just describe these guys, you describe the guy from the DC Blacks that was huge too. How do they get so big if they locked up? Oh, they exercise continuously in that cell. They, they're, they get uh, um, something full of water and they'll lift that up and down, up and down. Or they do push-ups like hundreds or thousands of push-ups a day. And um, they'll go by themselves and that, that's all they're doing. They're working out. Running in place. Uh, just constantly working out because they know as soon as they come out of that cell, they may have to fight for their life. And so they... They worked out a lot. Okay. And this this green fellow, he uh, he was a monster in, as I would describe him as in stature and in personality. I mean, he he is the guy that found the couple broke down in the desert on the side of the road, and him and his friend said, "Hey, let's rape the sixty year old lady and then kill her." And then we'll, we'll murder the, the son who's in his 30s and leave him dead in the desert. And that's basically what they did. The only reason he got caught was that they didn't murder the, the son enough. I mean, they, they cut his throat, stabbed him a bunch of times, beat his corpse or what they thought was, and it threw him in a ditch way out in the desert and left him. And he regained consciousness, dragged himself back, and got help and told off. That's the only reason they caught his green and his friends. And Green, while he was in the county jail, they locked him in a cell with one of his co-conspirators, and he figured, hey, this guy's a witness. So he strangled that guy to death. So that's Green. And then he works out constantly. He gets drunk one day, and him and his Aryan Brotherhood friends decide that they're going to cause holy hell. They almost took over the unit. I mean, they, they fought us all the way up to the drill that... Uh, leads you out into the unit. When you say the they when, when you say they fought when, when they say the they doors and let everybody lose. When you say they fought y'all, y'all physically was in a fight with him and other inmates? Yeah, they let out nine at a time in those days because they said, Well, we don't have to let out just uh four like what they used to do. We'll let out nine. So they let out nine and it had to be all Aryan Brotherhood members or their associates. They got drunk, wouldn't go back started um, 
um, you know, assaulting the inmates that were in the cells. So then we were supposed to go down there and make them quit. And we had, uh, uh, I don't know if you know about some of these weapons. There's a thing called the L9, and it shoots uh, bean bag rounds, which is like getting hit by, you know, Mike Tyson or something. These things really hit you hard. Um, then they had uh, smoke rounds, gas rounds, and they went down there and just emptied that L9 on uh, his Green and his friends. They shot Green at point blank with a um, bean bag round in the crotch. It caused him to lose one of his testicles, and it didn't even slow him down. He, uh, I saw a guy that was well over six foot um, hit him with a nightstick. I saw the shockwave go through this guy's body, and it didn't matter to him. When he got to me, I hit him in the head as hard as I could, like three or four times, as hard as I could, Louisville slugger style, and he didn't care. I mean, I saw I saw the stick make gouges in his scalp and blood start flying out, and he didn't care. It didn't matter. So I jumped on his back and was trying to choke him with the stick, strangle him, put him out of, you know, just shut off his air long enough that he would pass out. Kill him. I hit him in the forehead. We fell back backwards. We're laying on the ground, and by now I'm really, really angry. Um, so I decided I'm going to strangle his ass until he's unconscious. And one of my coworkers said, he's down, roll him over and we'll cuff him. And I said, you know, fuck you, I'm choking him. And, uh, oh, this guy walks over to me and says, I'm telling you to stop. And he got the same answer. So he slaps me on the side of the head, leaves his big red mark on me, rings my bell good, and I'm still not stopping. So he said to me, if you don't stop, I'm going to hit you hard next time. And I thought, well, what the hell was that? Uh, so I relented because I couldn't defend myself against this other officer and uh, they cuffed him and took him away but we almost lost that unit now how do how do inmates get drunk on a maximum security unit well it goes back to that genius stuff you're talking about they can take bread and uh, somehow some of the uh, yeast survives the baking process. They can extract that and take the fruit that we give them and ferment it. And they can do it in such a way that they keep the odor away. And we have to physically enter the cell to find it. And they're only making, you know, a quart at a time. And enough of them can do that that these guys can turn up enough hooch to get drunk. <laughs> y'all, do y'all confiscate a lot of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a daily thing. That and weapons. We were always confiscating weapons because they made weapons as fast as, as we could find them. What, what did you generally find weapons at? Uh, out on the range because they don't want to be associated with the weapon. So they'll, they'll hide it in the um, heat registers, you know, taped up underneath something or jammed in somewhere. Or they would keep them in their cell in some place that they thought we couldn't find. And occasionally we'd find one in the cell. They made them out of everything. Sticks that they'd find out on the range. They uh, they kept saran wrap, melted it down, and made ice. We call them ice picks. They look like a, an icicle that would hang off the side of your house. They're all clear. Mm -hmm. But uh, you wouldn't believe it, but saran wrap made that way can make a hell of a spike. Um you know, if they were ever able to get metal, they would cut it off in the bars, the, um, some portion of the grills, you know, whatever they, whatever metal they could get. They might tip the um, broom handle with a, with a metal uh, arrowhead or, or spearhead. They made bows and arrows. Mm. Yeah, just, just like you said, there's, there are some really intelligent people that... Apply it to nothing but evil, but I mean, you can look back and go, "Man, that was pretty smart." I never would have thought of that. Right, right, right. What year did you uh, retire? Twenty twelve. And what year did you start your YouTube channel? By twenty seventeen. I really, really enjoy your work. 
sir. Um, could you give your name again and give your um the, the uh, some identification on your YouTube channel so my viewers can go and check you out? I really, really appreciate your time this this afternoon. Oh, my pleasure. Um, my YouTube channel is as the key turns, and uh, I'm David Lehman. David Lehman. Um, I really, really appreciate you. Um, Mar that that was uh, Marion. Yeah, that was the United States Penitentiary at Marion, Illinois. And at the time, what was that? What was Marion ranked as far as security wise in the, uh, the Bureau of Prisons? They rated federal prisons then one to six. So they'd say a level one to level six, and we were the only level six uh, supermax, is what they ended up calling us. Wow, they got they got a more in, a more uh, a more secure institution now though, right? Like Colorado or something. I don't know if it's more secure or not. It was special built for the purpose, but uh, the way that I I get to talk to some of the people that work there and the way that they are operating it, the the personnel is just not up to the same standard as as Marion. And I'm I'm sure that the people that worked at Alcatraz said the same thing about the people at Marion. So, you know. Wow. Um, did they have a cert team while you were uh, at Marion? Did they have a what team? A cert team. That's the, uh, they, the, the, oh. the, the, the Ninja Turtles. S-O-R-T. Sort. S -O -R -T, sort. Oh, they, they call them. Operations and tactics. Yes, we had one. Was you a part of it? No, I was never part of anything special at all. I was just a regular old guard that went to work every day. All right. David Lehman, man, I appreciate your time, man. This is Gully TV, man. Um, subscribe to my channel, and um, maybe we can do this again sometime. Your expertise and your experience on the Bureau of Prisons was fabulous. And, again, I appreciate your time, sir. Oh, thank you. And uh, um, where are you located at? And if I'm ever in your area, we can do it in person. We can do it in person anytime. I'm a traveling media outlet. Um I was uh, based in, in Pennsylvania, but I'm all over the place. I'm, I'm even in Europe and overseas on a regular. So, yeah. Gully TV. Oh. Yep. So if you hit Chicago or um, St. Louis, let me know. And if I'm in the area, we'll do it. All right. We'll do it. I appreciate you, Dave. All right. Thank you. Yep.